Great to see all of you, join in with all of you. I have an announcement to make on this week after Easter. Jesus is still risen. He's just as risen today as what he was last Sunday. We got to celebrate this, this continuation of 52 weeks a year of celebrating the resurrected Jesus on this uh, Sunday that he arose. Last week, we were talking about meeting Jesus, about meeting the resurrected Jesus, as people discovered for the first time. And today, uh, that, and, and just how extraordinary that was. There was lots of uncertainty about what this means. How do you relate with somebody who is resurrected after all? And, and uh, how does that change? This week, let's continue on with that. Let's think about this, about meeting and believing Jesus. And this morning we'll look into John chapter 20, starting at verse 19. So it starts out by saying that Sunday evening, and the Sunday evening that it's referring to is the Sunday that Jesus arose, okay? So we start with what happens the evening of the day that Jesus arose, and then a few verses into it, it goes to eight days later. So just that we're tracking here as we read this from John 20, verses 19 to the end of the chapter, verse 31. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they're forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time, Thomas was with them. The doors were locked but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous things in addition to the ones recorded in this book, but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. We start out in this passage, the disciples are meeting behind locked doors because they're in fear. They were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Now, they're still working out in their minds what had happened. We're only hours into this extraordinary event that this man that they've been following for years died, and then suddenly, above all their expectations, rises again from the dead, and here they are. Mary had talked with Jesus, and so she's saying he had risen. Peter and John had been to the tomb. They saw it was empty. John says, I, I, I believe that he rose, but I didn't yet understand how significant that was, that this was the way of redemption and salvation that the Scriptures had been, had been talking about all along. So, but, but what complicates it is that the Jewish leaders were releasing fake news. Fake news that the disciples had come, had stolen the body, had carried him off somewhere so that they could go about uh, populating this myth that this rabbi, this teacher, 
this heretic that was taking people away from their airtime, that he had risen so that they could keep their, their following going on. Well, let's just take two minutes to think about that, how ludicrous that really is, because the fact that fishermen and accountants and whatever other common occupations people had could overwhelm armed guards that are placed at the tomb is rather preposterous. <laughs> Plus, look at their state of mind. They're huddled behind closed doors. They're not on the verge of staging some sort of coup to take over or to do anything extraordinary. They're not thinking in that direction. They had missed all that Jesus had been saying about dying and rising again. When Jesus had said, I'm going to die, they huddled together and things said, and started to get philosophical, like, like Greg, what, what, what do you think he means by that when he says die? Because actually that statement couldn't be a literal statement because we know exactly what's going to happen. He's going to be the Messiah. He's going to set up a kingdom. Jewish religion is going to prosper. The nation of Israel is going to be dominant again. We're going to return to the golden age of King David. Of course, that's not what Jesus meant. Guess what he meant? He meant that he was going to actually die. So they're on the defensive. They're not prepared to make the next move. Now, we're not blaming the disciples. They are here just figuring out what had happened because they're there, they're mourning the death of a dear friend. They're, their hopes are shattered. They're mourning the loss of this dream that this Jesus was going to be the Messiah. So how, how could they go on? And in the midst of that, Jesus is suddenly there among them. Didn't knock at the door. Didn't do anything else. Just suddenly they're aware the presence of God is here. It happened among us in worship this morning. We were singing along. We were praising. And then the Spirit of God was manifest with us in the room. And the worship went to a deeper level. Because the Spirit of God was connecting with your spirits. And as your hearts kept on worshiping, that presence deepened among us. So suddenly, Jesus was there in the room. And of course, how do you respond to something like that? So again, their emotions are on, or I mean, their emotional circuits are being broken, right? They're, they're, they're being blasted here. And so Jesus speaks out to them and says, peace be with you. He says that three times in this scripture. Peace be with you. Now, this word peace is more than our word of, hey, kids, settle down. That's not what we're talking about here. We're not just talking, teachers, about let's have a little bit quieter in the classroom. We're not just saying, like, let's have the absence of conflict. We're not just saying uh, this is not a passive word. It's not just settle back in your armchair and be comfortable, be relaxed, be at peace. This is an active word. Peace, in the Hebrew, is the word shalom. It means health and wholeness and all of your being. It's growing. Peace, in, in the Greek, doesn't quite carry all that. But, but it has this life and vitality, this activity, this presence of the Almighty God. But this wasn't the first time that Jesus had talked about peace. Jesus had been talking about peace. In John 16, 33 is the verse where Jesus says, in this world, you will have troubles, but, take, but be of good cheer or have peace. I've overcome the world. I have won the victory, so join in with me and know that whatever the troubles and circumstances are that you're going through now, that that's not the end. That will not be what wins when you align yourself with Jesus, when you take hold of this peace that he has. 
in the book of John, from John chapter 14 through John chapter 17, is this long discourse that Jesus teaches. So this is right before he's arrested by the Jewish leaders. And, and in John 16 that we've just mentioned, he is, is in this discourse. So he's talking about peace, about this peace that overcomes trouble on the day before he's arrested, all right? So this wasn't like months and months ago and some obscure, obscure corner somewhere. This was like one of the things that Jesus had been speaking to them just before all the trial, the arrest, the, the crucifixion and all that happened. You with me here? Now, earlier in that conversation, in John chapter 14, he says this. Peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give to you. Not as the world does, but the peace that I give means that your hearts don't have to be troubled. You don't have to be afraid. And now here Jesus is in chapter 20, and he comes in among these people that he'd been exhorting not to be afraid, and they're afraid. And he extends his peace again. Jesus, the Spirit of Jesus, keeps showing up to minister to you in where you need it. Don't let any temptation of the enemy come at you and say, because I failed, therefore I'm not deserving. You're not deserving, but that's outside of the equation. We are all deserving when we place ourselves before Jesus and take on his righteousness, and his salvation. So the fact that you don't get it, the fact that you trip up, means one thing. It means that you're looking for Jesus again to receive whatever that promise is that he has for you. And in this case, peace, I leave with you. My peace is there. I remember vividly when I was a young adult, 39 years ago. Now, I didn't stop being a young adult 39 years ago. I'm looking over at you young adults there, okay? But I was already a young adult 39 years ago, okay? I'm in a discipleship missions training program, and the leader of the training center is, uh, we're at the end of a worship time. The Spirit of God had moved. A number of us have gone forward for ministry, and he lays his hands on me, and he says, let this brother know that the promises of God are for him. Now, I had grown up in a very Christian family. I say very Christian because we went to church Sunday morning. The question was, which church are we going to Sunday night, not if we're going to church Sunday night. And usually we went on Wednesday night as well. And my parents read bedtime stories to me, Bible bedtime stories. And they sent us to a Christian school where we had Bible class. I tell you, I learned to know the Bible not in seminary, but in my growing up years, okay? So here this person was saying, let this person know that the promises of God are for him. I knew the text. I knew what was there in the book. But what he was imparting into me that day was not about just intellectual knowledge. It was not about simply, do you know it up here? as though you could write the answers on a test. What he was realizing, what the Lord was revealing to him, is that far too much of that word stayed up here, and that what was needing to be opened in my life was that it needed to filter down into the heart of my life, into the center of my being, that the promises of God influence my emotions, that they govern my thoughts, that they led me in the directions that my life would take. That these words of God that created the whole world is enough to sustain your life and to carry you through. Lord, open our ears that we can hear those words and hear the promises to draw us through the troubled times. So to you this morning, hear this proclamation from Jesus. Peace be with you. The aliveness and energy of the Spirit of God be what is 
upon you, be what's empowering you, be what's carrying you through, that all the other false pretenses, all the other things that come onto your radar screens would be sidelines and peripheral to this fact of where your hope is set. Peace be with you. Well, eight days later, (laughs) they're there again in the room, doors locked, and Jesus appears with them. Now, the distinction in the scripture is that the first time Thomas had not been there with them. Thomas was one of the 12 disciples. Thomas had not been there. And so Thomas had said, I won't believe unless I see it for myself. A lot of us in the schooling that we had, the education that I had, we are Thomases, where we've been taught that scientific verification is the only form of reality. A scientific, rationalistic worldview. If you can't prove it, it doesn't exist. If it's not repeatable, it's not true. Does that sound? That's the scientific method, right? Anybody with me this morning? You study that? You know this to be true? So, so, so that's Thomas. Sometimes we're kind of like, Thomas, the doubter. What's the matter with him? He's most of us, brothers and sisters. Thomas says, I want to see it for myself. And Jesus says, okay, (laughs) here I am. Peace be with you. And then he goes on and says to Thomas, don't be faithless any longer. Believe. The NIV says, don't doubt, but believe. Now, this word faithless and the word believe are actually forms of the same word. So what he's saying is, do not be faithless, be faithing. Do not be unbelieving, be believing. And it's in that active sense. It is This is an action that you take on that needs to be exercised in your life. And so the question to us becomes today, how are we believing? Thomas, you're so caught up in evidence... Let me turn the tables. What's the evidence? The evidence that you are faithing this morning. The evidence that you are living by faith. That this action of who Jesus is, that you're believing, that he's risen from the dead, that he is the Lord and Savior. What's the difference that that's made in your life? You're walking that out in faith. You're faithing this morning that that is true. Now, Jesus talked about believing earlier in his discourse as well, in John 14. He says, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Did you catch what he's saying there? When he's saying the Father, he's talking about God, Yahweh, the creator God, the one that, that, that is worshiped, that created the world. And he's saying, here I am, Jesus And that's me. And I'm him. (laughs) That's a very audacious claim, except that it was true. So sometimes you hear Jesus didn't really claim to be divine. I beg to differ. This is a very clear claim of Jesus' divinity, where he says, I'm the Father, and the Father's in me. We're one and the same. So So believe, he says, believe that the Father's in me and I'm in the Father. Or at least believe me because of the miracles that you see me do. Now, sometimes we're told to come and get our miracle. Come and get your miracle. Wait for your miracle. I want to tread carefully here. But I also want us to show that he's saying, there's there's two ways that you can believe in me. If you can't fully believe that I am the full possession of all that the Father God is here among you, at least believe on the power that I have. At least believe. But the preferred way is that you're believing in the full divinity and not only when you see his actions in your life. 
See, there's this subtle thing that can happen. When we're believing for our miracle, and then it comes that we sort of say, well, it was my faith that got it for me. That I deserved it because I had enough faith and that really I'm the one that's working for it, so therefore I'm the one that brought the miracle. Do you follow me? That's not faith in Jesus. He doesn't show up and do things for us because we're deserving. He does it because it's his nature. He does it because he's God among us, and God's about subduing the evil in this world and bringing back into reconciliation all that the devil has destroyed. So you can believe on the levels of the miracles, or you can believe that God is among us, that you can join with the agenda of the miracle worker rather than asking him to place himself in your agenda, that you can become part of his agenda. Let me add the corollary now, knowing that his agenda is for your life to be reconciled with him. So I'm not discouraging you experiencing the power, the the miraculous power of God in your life. I'm just saying, please have it be a subset of your dedication and loyalty to be following Jesus. So that you not only are experiencing him, but you're taking on his nature. God's will for you is not just for you to be experiencing miracles, but for you to be extending them out to others. He says, if you carry his name and his power, you will be doing greater things than what he does because he's exercising this reality that he is one with the Father. So we're part of this body in whom the resurrected spirit of God dwells. Therefore, this is where life happens. This is where our lives are placed. This is where we see his power and his grace taking forth in our life. Next point. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. This is, this is a, a little bit more obscure Great Commission than the famous one in Matthew and, and uh, Acts. Jesus is saying, the Father sent me to this world, and in the way that he sent me, I'm sending you. And how's that way? It's with the power of the Father within me. His power is his spirit, so therefore receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit so that you are sent in the same way that I was sent into this world. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells with you. The Spirit of God dwells in you that gives power to live in victory, that gives power to be ministering into other people's lives, that allows you to be carrying on the mission of Jesus in this world. This is how we're sent to communicate the good news. That it's invitation that Jesus will meet with you. There's a very lovely, beautiful evangelist among us this morning. And it's my wife, June. And so I'd like you to uh, come up here, June, if you would be so kind. And, and uh, let me interview you a little bit. Now, let me set this up. One day, when we were on home leave, during the time that we were in Hong Kong, and I was jetting across Asia, supervising mission teams and things like that, and somebody came to me and said, Glenn, how does your wife feel about you like dragging her into this mission life? And I'm like, oh, no, 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 you got it wrong. I'm the one that's out front, but she's the one that's dragging me into it. And in case I never said thank you, let me say thank you for doing that dragging, okay? You're welcome. So, so, so June in Hong Kong would, would go weekly up into the northwest corner of Hong Kong so that she could be ministering to young mothers who had never heard of Jesus before. They were recent immigrants out from, out from China. What a wonderful way to spend a season of life. But this morning, we're not going to be talking about that. 
I want to be talking about how you're living this Jesus commission life right now. And I want to start with how you're reaching out on Palm Sunday. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So I don't really see myself as an evangelist in the sense that Glenn is talking about. But I, what I do know is that when I get an idea, I need to follow through with that idea because God is telling me to do something. And sometimes the ideas are a little bit strange. Um, but on Palm Sunday, we had palm leaves here, right? And we had some extra palm leaves. So I thought, why, why not give out some of these palm leaves? Everybody loves palm branches, right? So after church, just, just on my own, because it's kind of a strange idea, I, I, you know those little red you are invited cards that are out on the Welcome Center? You need to put some of those in your pocket or in your bag and keep them with you. I took a pile of those and I stapled one a card to each palm branch, right? And so then I went over to Giant, and I stood in the median, like in the center of the street, as people were coming into Giant and as they were leaving, and I just waved these palm branches. And people stopped. I had, there was a wife who smacked her husband and was like, stop the car, stop the car, it's a palm branch. And I gave her a palm branch, and I said, we're from that church right over there, you know, because I was right there, you know, I pointed to the church. I had um, a drive-by, you know, somebody rolled down their, I mean, <laughs> right? Their window went down, their hand came out. They wanted the palm branch. And in probably 15 minutes, I handed out 30 palm branches, you know, and I was like, that was really fun. <laughs> And people really, really wanted them. They were, you know, they were responding to them. <laughs> William came by in his car, and he was like, hey, I know you. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't take any? He had one already. <laughs> uh, you also, every week, share the live stream of the service on, 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 on your Facebook page, and just... Tell us what the impact is that you've seen from that. Well, I do it because I got tired of Paris, like, harping on me. Like, share the stream, share the stream. But I do share the stream. Sometimes when I come up to the piano, you'll see me with my phone. And it's not because I'm not focused on worship. It's because I'm trying to share the live stream quickly before we start worship. And um, I never really saw that as a, an important act until I started seeing co-workers come in. You know, co-workers who I had friended on Facebook or neighbors who was who were friends with me on Facebook. And I was like, I don't know if they stayed. I don't know if they cared. But they were there, you know. And so um, I do see that as an important and easy, you know, a very basic task that I can do. Share that live stream and say, come to church with me. So if evangelist is too daunting of a term, we can all be sharers of the good news. We can all be inviters and be these winsome witnesses. Uh, let's just take one more. Uh, you are a public school teacher in a public school district, and we all know that God is forbidden to enter public schools, right? So how do you? Not so. <laughs> um, in the past, I have been a part of a prayer group that meets at my school. Um, we have to meet before school hours, but we are allowed to meet on school grounds. Um, that sort of leveled out with COVID because we weren't in the building. But we did meet for a while on um, over, over the air waves. And so that is one way. Um, I send encouraging emails to other teachers with um, songs that have been meaningful to me, you know, if I know that they're, they're struggling with something. Or offering to pray for people, you know, just one-on-one, -on -one, not in a class, not in a formal way. But, you know, um, can I pray with you about that? And usually people are, you know, receptive to that. Thank you. We could go on and on, but that gives you a, a, a way of how June is nudged to be responding to this great commission, witness of Jesus, and we share it to be stimulating into your life about simple ways that the Holy Spirit will be leading you just to be extending this Jesus witness 
to other people. So finally, this will take 30 seconds and we're ready to transition. It says in the end, once again, this call to believe, believe, which means come into agreement with. The word belief is a word of persuasion. It, 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 it means that I formally was thinking some other way, but now I'm believing, I'm persuading, I've changed my way of thinking in life, and I've come into agreement with. We're in these weeks of doing baptisms when we are giving testimony of people's lives who are coming into agreement with this way of living for the resurrected Jesus. And this morning, Pastor Kia is going to be interviewing the lovely young lady that we're going to be baptizing today.